Okay, so my talk today is on, uh, it's on the topic of Bayesian statistics, and in particular it's about the idea of how to aggregate multiple measurements when there's a possibility of a systematic failure. So briefly, so I'm Lachlan Gunn, I'm from the University of Adelaide, and I've got a uh, fellowship from the Australian Government to come here and do some research into stochastic systems. So Adelaide's up here, as in all Australian maps. Um, <laughs> we're up in uh, South Australia. This is our engineering building. Uh, we opened fairly early in Australia's history and we're third university in Australia. We've had a few uh, well-known people in Adelaide that have either studied in Adelaide and then uh, done later work or have been uh, in Adelaide for their research, including three Nobel Prize winners and Ronald Fisher, who spent uh, the later part of his life in Adelaide. So I'm going to start with a historical question. So the ancient Hebrews, under their judicial tradition, their high court for capital crimes, they would require 23 judges and they required a bit more than a majority in order to convict, in order to provide the death penalty. But if all of the judges unanimously voted to convict, or if they all voted for death, then what the court would do is they would decide, no, we're going to acquit instead because uh, it seems like that's a good idea. So the question is, why would you do that? Well, there are some explanations for that that are given in the text, which I should talk about later. But the essence is, and this is the theme of this talk, that highly consistent observations really should not be trusted. If, um, hence the title of the talk, if things seem too good to be true, then there's probably been a mistake. So why does this happen? So suppose you've got a very small voltage that you want to measure on the order of a nanovolt or two. And you've got a, vo a voltmeter, but it's quite noisy. So you connect it up and you see, okay, there's 1.2 nanovolts, that's reasonable, that's the kind of measurement we're expecting, but because you know that there's going to be a lot of noise, you repeat the measurement. So you do it again and you say, well, okay, it was probably fairly good the first time, but you keep going because, you know, obviously you want to be sure that could just be chance. So the third time, things start to look like you have a lot of luck in that despite all of the noise present in the system, you've got three measurements that are exactly the same to three significant figures. And then finally you conclude that the meter's broken, or that it's not plugged in, or something like that. And that's the essential idea, that if you've got too much consistency, it usually indicates that your experimental setup is done in such a way that measurements that you think are all independent really aren't in practice. So an example of this uh, this is an example that involves some police work that happened in Germany uh, in the early 2000s. So they found a serial killer who her existence was known only by DNA. So they did DNA tests based on uh, samples that they found at each crime scene and they found this same DNA in each of them over the course of about nine years. All they knew from the DNA, they knew from the DNA that it was a woman, but that was it. Now, DNA being present at the crime scene, it doesn't automatically mean that you're guilty, it just means that you were there or a piece of you was there. And so there's a possibility that, well, it's just by chance. And so to say that, okay, the DNA's there, you're not necessarily guilty. But it sort of starts to stretch the bounds of reason when you say, well, you were there, sure, that doesn't mean you were guilty, but you were there at 40 different crimes spread over three countries over the course of nine years, and that's probably not just a coincidence. And that starts to suggest, well, maybe if we find someone with this DNA, perhaps she really is a criminal. And so you might come to that conclusion, and you'd think that as you found more and more crimes where that DNA was present, you'd become more and more sure of that conclusion. The problem happened when the police finally found the identity of someone with the DNA. So they checked a fingerprint card for something else, they ran it through the database, but they found it matched a man, and the DNA was female. 
So this caused a certain amount of confusion. So they did some more investigation and they found that their serial killer worked at their cotton swab factory. So all of their samples had been contaminated up to that point because they had used cotton swabs that weren't meant for DNA collection. And the probability of this happening is small because they did go to some effort to try to get uh, cotton swabs that they thought would be very clean because they were all nicely bagged up and uh, nicely packaged. And they thought the exact words of the piece were, well, we looked at the packaging and it seemed like the Mercedes of cotton swabs. And then the manufacturer said, well, yeah, but it's not meant for DNA collection because it was completely sterile, but it didn't destroy all traces of DNA. And so one of the people that was handling it when it was being manufactured, her um, DNA got onto it. And then every time they ran a test, the police ran a test, there was a chance that it would uh, appear. Another example of uh, conclusions that you can come to by looking at police records that don't quite work out was in uh, Ireland there were about 50 uh, different records of someone called Pravo Yazdi and all with different addresses. So each time this guy got pulled over he would hand over an ID card there wouldn't be anything in the system with that name and address and so he'd go on. But then the fine would get sent away and it never got paid. Now there aren't really many people called Bravo Yazdi and so you might come to the conclusion that there must be someone who's handing out a lot of fake ID cards. So he's got a whole lot of identity cards and each time he gets pulled over by the police he gives them a different one and so the fines never get connected to him. And you'd think as more and more of these happen, relative to the number of real Provo Yazdis in the world, you would come to the conclusion that it's more and more likely that this Provo Yazdi is a criminal. And this seemed reasonable up until a Polish speaker saw the file and realised that Provo Yazdi meant driver's licence. And uh, obviously this was quite embarrassing for all involved because there were 50 of these in the system that had been uh, registered and no one had noticed. So the common ingredient in all of these is that there is some sort of failure state that's hidden. It's not immediately obvious, but it tends to give results that point in some direction. And it might seem that this kind of failure is very unlikely, and in often cases it is. But the chance of getting a whole lot of measurements that all agree by chance is also very small. And often the small probability of agreement will outweigh the small probability of a failure. So we do a Bayesian analysis here to try to find what the probability of the varying original hypothesis. So in the case of a police thing, it's whether someone's guilty or not guilty, for example based on the evidence that's available. And we want to do this taking into account the possibility that there is some sort of failure. So what uh, we'll do is call the variable that determines if the system is failed F, and then we use Bayes' law to try to find the probability of the varying hypotheses. And so we get this a posteriori probability that's dependent on the measurement distributions uh, here and the prior distributions here. So, start off with a little toy example to try to essentially get all of the maths out of the way. We imagine we dig up an M4 from the ground, so a big Roman pot. And we don't know where it's from because the Roman Empire was a big place and maybe it was found on the Franco-Italian border and it's not known whether it was made in Italy and then brought north, or made in Gaul and brought south. So what you can do is then send a piece off to the lab and then that will test whether it came from Gaul. And if there's a positive result, it was Gaul, negative result, Italian. But the question then is how accurate is this going to be because the test can't be perfect. A chemical analysis, you'd think it would be fairly accurate, but if you're only testing for a trace element, then maybe not, it could get contaminated, it could just not react properly. Or if the lab's doing a visual inspection, so if they're looking at it and looking at the style of the pieces, then 
maybe they'll get it wrong. So there's going to be some problems with accuracy. And we need to take into account, take this into account when we model the system. So we have two parts. We've got the prior distribution and the measurement distribution. So we'll talk about the measurement distribution first. So we're saying here that it's 70% accurate and it's symmetric. So if it's from Ghoul, the test will come back as being from Ghoul 70% of the time and it'll get it wrong 30% of the time. And the same if it came from the Italian peninsula. But there's a small probability that it's contaminated and in this case it will almost always come back from the lab. So the lab will say it came from Ghoul irrespective of where it came from in reality. So this could be things due to things like contamination, it could just be an unusual uh, specimen that's been found. It could be that the lab has almost all Gallic amphorae and has just accidentally mixed up the email addresses and sent back the wrong, uh, the wrong results to the wrong person. But for whatever reason, something happens and it'll tend to give the wrong results. And we say that this happens with relatively small probability. So the prior here shows a 1% chance, if you add these two up, a 1% chance that you'll get this contamination effect. So a 1% chance that the test will fail. And otherwise, we say it's equally likely that the amphora comes from Gaul or Italy. And so when we do this, we run a certain number of tests and we see how many come back positive. And this will be binomially distributed. And so we can substitute this back into our formula for the posterior probability and get uh, some results. Now in this case though, what we're interested in is what happens if all of the results are unanimous. So what happens if every test comes back, so you send back five pieces of the amphora, send them off to the lab, and then they all come back as saying from Gaul. So we can do some slight simplification there, though I'm not going to belabor the mathematics uh, from here and just going to go straight to the plot. So if there's no chance of contamination, so if the test always works properly, then the more tests you make and the more come back positive, the more certain you are that it's from Gaul. So this is this orange curve here and it converges exponentially to probability one. So after about between five and ten uh, pieces have been tested you can be basically certain that it came from Gaul. But when you've got contamination that's where things become less clear. So we look at this blue case, this blue curve matches up to the numbers that I showed on the previous slide where there's a one percent chance that the test has failed. And in this case, it starts going up as before, but when you get to about five uh, samples that have all come back positive, then it starts dropping off. So you reach your maximum confidence of around 95% certain that it's from Gaul, but then confidence starts falling away. So if you send away 10 pieces of pot and they come back saying they're from Gaul, it's less convincing than if you send five pieces and they all came back. So you have the slightly paradoxical situation where you would have been a lot more certain about the origin, you would have been a lot more certain about uh, the truth had only the test been less clear. So had only your data been uh, more confusing, you would have been a lot more sure of your results. So another application uh, of this which I find interesting is the application to eyewitness testimony because this is interesting in that it's a real situation that happens quite often and it has fa a fairly high cost of failure and yet there is a probability, a small probability that it will be failed, that it will fail without anyone noticing and there's no way to directly determine this. So what the police do is they make an, have an identity parade when they want to try to identify a suspect. So they bring a suspect in and then they put him in a line with a bunch of other people. In this case, the suspect is in the middle. 
And they bring the witness in front and they say, OK, so can you pick the criminal out of this group? And the idea is that if the suspect isn't really guilty, then ideally the witness will say, OK, no, he's not there. Um, he must be innocent. Or, and what tends to happen is they'll still guess, but they won't be able to pick the suspect with a probability better than chance. So in this case where there are five people, a witness who hasn't seen the suspect before should ideally pick the suspect only 20% of the time. And the hope is that if the suspect really is guilty, if the suspect really did commit the crime, then the witness would be able to choose the suspect, would be able to identify him with a much greater probability than that. So this one has five uh, people in the US, which is where most of the data comes from. They use seven. In the UK, they use 10. And it turns out that eyewitnesses are unreliable because human memory is inherently untrustworthy. And so what uh, has been found in experiments is that around 50% of the time, if the suspect really is guilty, then the witness will be able to identify them. And if the suspect isn't guilty, then the witness will still pick someone 80% of the time. But the hope is that if you've got enough people in the lineup, then the chance that they pick the suspect <coughs> is small. So in the experiment where I got this data from, they found that 80% of the time, the witness would still pick someone. And so you divide that by the number of witnesses, so you divide that by the number of people in the lineup, and you get this 13% probability that the suspect will be picked if they're innocent, assuming that the lineup has been done in an unbiased way. So if it's been carried out properly. But then there's the possibility that it's been done in a biased way. And so whether intentionally or unintentionally, the witness is being led to pick the suspect. As an example of how this could happen, for example, you see that the suspect in this case has his number in a different position. That tends to catch the eye and so the witness will be more likely to pick him. And there are lots of other ways that it can happen. Uh, and so the possibility that this can occur is realistic. So we've used the same uh, prior distribution as before, so saying a 50-50 chance that the suspect is guilty or not guilty. And we find the posterior distribution as before. And this is where things get interesting because even with very small rates of failure, the effect has quite a large uh, effect on the response. So we start with the 1% chance of failure. So in this case, maximum has occurred with three unanimous witnesses. So essentially, if you assume that there's a 1% chance that the procedure is done in a biased way, if you have more than three witnesses agreeing, you need to start doubting uh, your conclusions. And while it's easy to intuitively understand that, sure, after you get too many people in, all in agreement, it starts to just suggest that something strange is happening, it's surprising to me at least that it should be with such a small number when there's only a 1% chance that the failure has occurred, that there is bias. Now, also, it's also worth noting that you can't actually get up to a 95% uh, certainty with three, uh, un three witnesses if they're unanimous. But even when you have much smaller probabilities of error, then the same effect occurs and it doesn't take many witnesses. So if you have 0.1%, so one in a thousand uh, identity parades done in a biased way, then your confidence starts to degrade after four witnesses uh, saying the same thing. And even if it's one in 10,000, maximum confidence occurs with five witnesses. So it doesn't take many people to all come into agreement before you have to start uh, worrying that something's gone catastrophically wrong. And 
we also see that this does have a big effect on confidence. But even so, once you start getting to very large numbers of uh, witnesses, if they all agree, then it tends to indicate that nothing has been gained by the process. And you might say that, well, most, uh, <coughs> most of this time there will be only a small number of witnesses and they'll be up here. But there have been some cases where uh, an identity parade like this has been done with 50 witnesses. So all the way out here, they've all been in, uh, they've all been in agreement. So this would tend to indicate that even with one in a, basically one in a million chance of an error, you're still getting no value from the process with 50 witnesses. But it was still able to be used as evidence. And so it shows that intuitively you might think that more witnesses in agreement is always going to be a good thing. But see that it doesn't take a very large probability of bias for things to come crashing down. And as I said before, it turns out that this was used in antiquity. And in the Talmud, there's actually a statement saying that if the Sanhedrin find unanimously for guilt, then they have to acquit. And the reason for that is that they believed that if there was no one who thought that the defendant was innocent, then probably there must have been, there must have been some evidence that hadn't been found uh, that indicated that indicated that the evidence was guilty. Because it should be never clear cut. If you keep digging, eventually you'll find some evidence that points in the other direction. And so if everything seems too closely in agreement, then probably the defendant hasn't been adequately defended. And so we've taken some estimates of modern courts um, of their accuracy and then tried to apply this rule and seen what the effect is in practice. So take these numbers with a certain grain of salt because these are just estimates and we're applying them to a court from 2,000 years before. So obviously uh, it's not going to be perfectly accurate. But what you can see, so this pink region here, that's the number of judges uh, that are condemning, voting to condemn. And in this pink region, the defendant will be convicted. And so what you see is up here, so this little white region here represents the, prob the possibility that the judges are unanimous and so they'll have to acquit. And what you see is in this region here, the probability of guilt actually starts falling off quite substantially. And even with this green one, so where there's a 1 in 10,000 chance of error, you can see that it goes from being essentially completely certain to almost certain, but with some lingering doubt. And by making this upper threshold here, so by rejecting unanimous verdicts, it substantially increases this threshold of guilt, uh, depending on which uh, probability of error that you see. But it still takes a lot more, uh, it still takes a lot more evidence to convict if you set the threshold here than if you do here. And this is in keeping with the tradition at the time which indicated that essentially you shouldn't use the death penalty without complete certainty. But I found it interesting that uh, when I was doing the research for this, finding that this had been intuitively understood in antiquity, even if it wasn't uh, rigorously analysed. But I'd like to talk about an engineering application. And I like cryptography in general, but this is a particularly interesting uh, area to do this type of analysis because ideally in a cryptographic system you want the probability of failure to be very small and often people try to make it to round 2 to the negative 128 now and this means that you're analysing very rare events and the events that you're analysing especially if you're hoping that they happen with probability 2 to the negative 128 are a lot less likely than almost any possible failure condition. And so in many cases, you'll actually have your theoretical performance limits dominated by the 
um, dominated by the failure, which you've not accounted for in the analysis, which is okay when you're talking about an algorithm, but when you're trying to design an entire system, then your error bounds become optimistic. So as an example, let's look at just how to encrypt a few bytes. So the way this code works is you just loop over a buffer of data that's come in and XOR a pseudo random byte. And the idea is that that byte changes for obviously for every loop iteration. And unless you know what they are, and they're determined by some key, unless you know what they are, you can't work out what the original data was after this function has been called. And so that's good, that's secure, and that's a common way of doing encryption. But what is interesting is now imagine a cosmic ray comes in. So there's some gamma ray burst on the other side of the universe that comes in and then hits a memory chip and just happens to hit the high order bit that represents that zero in memory. <coughs> so now that zero changes from being zero to two to the power of 63. And so you have this loop. So you start at the 2 to the power of 63 bit of this data and then say, OK, well, is that greater than the length or is that less than the length? No? OK, well, we must be at the end of the data. Let's stop. And so the loop never gets run. And as a result, in the case that this particular error happens, data won't be encrypted. And it doesn't have to just be the high order bit. If any of those bits change, then at least some bytes in that uh, data won't be encrypted. And this is a big problem. And in many cases, the blocks that are actually being encrypted will be small. They might be hundreds of bytes or at most thousands of bytes. In which case, almost any bit error that affects this variable or this constant will cause all of the data to be unencrypted. But you'd hope this would be quite rare because there aren't that many um, cosmic rays floating about that just happen to hit a memory chip at just exactly that bit because there are billions uh, of bits in a memory module. But despite that, um, you don't get that many errors. And Google have done some research and they found that each year around one in eight memory modules would suffer a bit error. And somewhere at random in there. So if you do the maths for that, you multiply, you scale by the number of bits in the memory module and bring that down to seconds. So in any given second, the probability that a bit will flip at random, be it due to cosmic rays or something else, will be around 2 to the negative 63. And yes, this is quite small, but it can still be significant. And I have a bit squatting here. So what um, someone thought to do a couple of years ago was thought, okay, so are these memory error, kind of memory errors significant in practice? And so what he did was he registered a bunch of domain names. So he made things like Microsoft.com, Facebook.com, but with one bit change. So Facebook.com might become FCCbook.com and similar things for Microsoft. So register these domains, put up a web server, and then waited to see whether computers would connect because you wouldn't type these addresses in. But if there was a bit error that changed the URL, or that changed the name of the server on the client computer, then it would connect to that instead of the real server. And they found that they received hundreds and hundreds of requests. So even this kind of small probability it can be significant in practice and it does change the security bounds a lot because if you're hoping for a 2 to the negative 128 probability of error or a probability of failure obviously this is much 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 worse than that so if you include all of the bits in that then for every second that this program has been running so for every second that that code has been in memory the probability that some of the data will fail to be encrypted is increased by in fact, <coughs> increase, increases by two to the negative fifty-seven, which is not that secure 
Um, it's perhaps secure enough in a lot of practical applications, but if you're hoping for a strong theoretical guarantee on the security of your system, then that's clearly uh, not what you would have been expecting. And so it's important in secure systems to use error correcting memory, which can substantially reduce the probability that this kind of error will occur. But another example other than, for example, that case where there's just a catastrophic failure, there will be tests in cryptographic systems that will need to test whether data satisfies some property, and often these will be probabilistic. So one example is the Rabin-Miller test, and the Rabin-Miller test uh, checks whether a number is prime. And each time you run it, you can be certain that uh, a number is prime, except with a failure probability of one quarter. So there's a one in four chance that a composite uh, number will be, will, this test will say that it's prime. And so the way that you deal with that, because obviously a one in four chance of failure isn't very good, you repeat it again and again and again, and ideally it'll follow this pink line, and you can get your two to the negative 128 error probability. And this is important because sometimes an external user will provide these numbers, and so perhaps an attacker can pick one that is particularly bad and that will break the system. So you do these tests and you try to get this false acceptance probability down to an acceptable level. Now this analysis, I've assumed that somewhere in that code there will be one bit that if flipped will cause a number to always be accepted. And in the paper, which I'll provide a link to later, then in the paper I show how this can happen with uh, assembly code and show where exactly a bit flip would cause this to happen. So it's theoretically possible. And what you find is that as you do more and more tests, the probability of a false acceptance decreases, but then it starts to bottom out because you're, the probability of false acceptance is no longer dominated by the chance that the algorithm will fail, but by the chance that some memory error or that some failure has caused the system to become insecure. Even though the code is perfect, what's actually loaded into the computer and what's running on the processor is no longer. And so you end up, after one second, two to the negative 63. After a month, it's two to the negative 40 something. And so these probabilities of false acceptance are clearly a lot worse than you would uh, think by just analyzing the algorithm. And just to show that you really do need error correcting memory if you want to achieve uh, the kinds of um, failure probabilities that algorithmic analysis will predict. Even after one nanosecond, there is still a big difference in what the algorithm would predict and what happens in practice. So the lesson to learn from that is that effects, even if they seem negligible, they can be highly significant when you're analysing unlikely scenarios. And often these are important. And in cryptography, they're very important because you're almost always trying to analyse uh, some very unlikely scenario. But the important thing is essentially if your experiment is bad, if uh, your experimental design doesn't, shouldn't give you bad data, so it shouldn't give you good data, then you shouldn't accept good data. Uh, so to shamelessly advertise the paper, it's now on archive. I'll put a link on the last slide as well. And we've had an article on phys.org last week, which was quite popular. So if this interested you, then it's worth looking that up. And again, I'll give a link on the last slide. So in conclusion, even very tiny rates of failure can be very important in some situations. They might not happen very often, but there are a lot of situations where they can substantially erode confidence in the conclusions that you make. And so if you want a system to be robust in its decision making, you need to try to take these into account and at least estimate uh, or hypothesise that there will be some chance of failure.
and you need to deal with that when you're making decisions and trying to aggregate data and essentially trying to reject data that is too heavily in agreement. So that's uh, all I'm going to talk about today. Do people have questions?